Good morning, church. Hi, my name is Ian. I'm in the third grade, and I have a friend with me. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Nicole. So glad that you're here in person. We want to say hi to those that are watching online. Let us know that you're there by putting a little thing in the comments, and we look forward to seeing you here gathering with your church family. If you're new here, welcome. Go to myclc.info slash new here. Yes, if you're new, we want to stay connected today and every day. So, Ian, we have something to share with the church family, right? Yes. Okay, are you guys listening? We had an amazing fundraising opportunity to get some students to go to camp last Sunday over here at Las Peñas. They opened up their doors for one day. We had students serving, taking orders, and having a great time. And we're excited to say how much we raised. So should we give them a drum roll? All right, the amount raised for our Las Peñas fundraisers to send kids to camp was $1,400. So let's praise God for his faithfulness. It was so amazing. Thank you for those families and those students that came over and participated with us. So, Ian, do you know what's happening on Saturday? Yes, do you? I sure do. I sure do, because it says right there. On Saturday, we are having at Lions Park in Mogador a community Easter egg hunt. We are partnering with the Lions Club, so we're going to have lots of eggs, we're going to have a special visitor, and we're going to have lunch. So be sure to bring your friends. It starts at 11 o'clock at the Mogador Lions Park. Um, where you can get a bunch of information about how to stay connected, activities that we're having, um, you can go to myclc.info. Um, we have an e-newsletter, there's a next steps table out there, and we have everything on social media media. So during this next song, we're going to be able to give with our offering and tithes here at the altar. There's one up in the balcony. Um, and Ian's going to share with you on where you can find all the information on sharing. MyCLC.info slash sharing. And will you please stand with us and worship us during this next song? All right, you guys ready to worship this morning? We have been waiting for you. We've had so much fun worshiping. Let's do it again. Yeah, put your hands together.
Seven. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we are set free from the power of sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we take just a moment here this morning to quiet our hearts, our minds, our spirits to invite you in to be with us. Help us to sense your presence this morning, Lord. We thank you that because of the cross, because of the sacrifice, that we are free. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, we got to be born into your family, Father. And we take a minute just to praise you and thank you within ourselves that we get to have God with us. So Lord, we ask that you open our hearts, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and to notice what you're doing in this space, that you would anoint the message and the word that you send for us, that we might learn how to continue to live from a heavenly perspective and forgetting that we're here in this world that is not our home just for a moment, Lord, that you would remind us of that. So it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you've ever gone hiking before, especially in the winter, you know that breaking trail is something you do when you encounter deep snow that's tough to navigate. When that happens, one hiker usually goes ahead of their group and clears the way so others can follow behind more easily. A trail breaker is someone who goes ahead, who makes a new way, who invites others to follow along behind them. In so many ways, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. But he did so much more than that too. Jesus never gives up on us. He understands our pain. He shows us love. He is alive. He can be trusted. And He gives us a mission. Good morning, church family. It's always good to be with you. It's always good to worship alongside you. I get into the habit of seeing people around town and I say things like, hey, I uh, can't wait to worship with you on Sunday. Uh, what a joy it is to be together. You know, sometimes when we're hurt, people will try to show up for us. But not always in the ways that we want or need. People might try to show up with, uh, show up with us or for us with like a first aid kit of things that they think will be beneficial. Uh, in, in this uh, concept of a first aid kit, they, they may uh, try to give you advice when you're hurting. Uh, just like in the, in the book of Job, if you ever read through the book of Job, uh, many, many chapters are devoted to his friends trying to give Job advice. Well, clearly this or clearly that, when sometimes they're just looking for you to call them and just listen and hear them out because they just need to talk out whatever's going on. I've had many conversations with people where I just needed to uh, let something out. And by the end of the conversation, I said, man, thank you so much. They said, I didn't even say anything. Well, I just needed to talk it out, and I needed to play it out in my own head, and that was super helpful. So sometimes people, uh, they, try, they try to be helpful, but really, you just need to make a phone call, not necessarily always give advice. Sometimes people will bring snacks. Have you ever had a situation where you eat your feelings? This is not a good idea. Do not do this on an ongoing basis, but if you're having a down day and you want to have a little moment, and sometimes people will bring you a special treat. Sometimes uh, a, a snacks can be medicine for the soul, maybe, you know, as you sit and you just enjoy a special treat with each other. And sometimes you just need someone who is willing to pick you up when you need to take a moment to breathe and get away from the tough situation. Sometimes you just need to say, hey, I'm going to come over, I'm going to pick you up, we're going to go do something. Uh, it doesn't even matter what you do, but just to get away from that environment or the situation or to change up somebody's thinking is super helpful. And so we're going to talk through today the understanding about how Jesus actually really truly understands our pain. You ever have somebody hurting and you say, oh, I understand what you're going through. Uh, little side note, no, you don't. 
actually. You know what it was like for you to go through that situation. So you have what you know, what you have from that experience, but you do not know exactly how that person is processing what's going on in their life. So the best we can do is just stare at them and just remind them, I love you. You are loved. I am with you. And get away from all the wordy stuff. This is hard for me because I, I do words a lot and I try to do them well and I want to just throw words at somebody, but sometimes you just need to stand with them. There's an old Jewish practice uh, where an individual was called sitting Shiva with somebody where when somebody was in mourning, they would go over to their house. Now, this might be a little bit awkward today, I understand, but in the culture of the days of the Bible, they would sit with them at their house. They would come, imagine me coming over to your house and sitting with you for days. Could be upwards about a week. And you really don't, and, and the goal isn't to talk. The goal is just to sit there with you. And people found such comfort in the fact that you were there. The reason why you show up and you have a seat and the reason why you wear out your welcome is because you won't stop trying to give them words. Right? So moms and dads, if you ever go over to your adult children's house, that you just being there can be a great encouragement. You don't need to say another word. Just let it be that your presence truly is enough. When life already hurts, people can add to that hurt, even if they don't mean to, when they fail to really get to know your pain, when they truly get to know what you're going through. Now, we're coming up in about two weeks to Easter Sunday, which means that believers all over the world are going to be celebrating the wonderful resurrection of Jesus. Last week, we walked through a little bit of the, the, the time leading up to the, res, the, leading up to the crucifixion, and, and then we jumped over the crucifixion last week, uh, and then we just focused a little bit on his resurrection, where he was with Peter and uh, just spending time with his disciples. Today and some next week, we are going to spend time specifically talking about the crucifixion. For us to be able to understand a little bit about what Jesus, the man Jesus, went through in his physical form, what God experienced as well. Now, I know this is hard to follow because how does God, this almighty, uh, supreme power and ruler, learn anything or experience anything if he already knows everything. Well, this is where we have to come with the idea of faith, knowing that Jesus was 100% God in the flesh and in the flesh, 100% man. But not 50-50, he was 100 and 100, completely both. And so we learned that, we, we know that Jesus learned and grew according to scripture. Like, wow, that is so crazy. But in his humanity, he didn't operate as God. He operated through his relationship with God. And you're like, but he is God. I know. That's the great awesome thing about our God is we don't have to understand him to follow him. In fact, I'm going to invite you just to try to learn from him and try not to fully understand everything. There's a great mystery of this amazing, awesome God that is consistent over time. He is for humanity. From the very beginning, he has, he, has, he has tried to create individuals that would be able to have a relationship with him, not because he needed it, but because out of his grace, he wanted to do it. He wasn't sitting around going, I'm bored. Let's create people and make it interesting. That was not the goal. There's nothing recorded in scripture to say that that was the goal, but in his grace to give us an opportunity at a relationship with him. Last week, we learned that uh, both Judas and Peter betrayed Jesus. We walked through that, how Judas uh, sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver and how Peter denied even knowing Jesus when the stuff hit the fan. And so as we're thinking about moving into today's thought, we're going to be jumping into Matthew chapter 27. So you can open your Bibles to Matthew 27, turn on your phones, uh, 
click on your iPads and go to the, your Bible app and go to Matthew 27. We're going to be starting in uh, verse 27 here in just a moment. Now, as we think through this portion of Scripture, as last week we talked about the betrayal leading up to the crucifixion, and then at, and we jumped over that, and then we went to the resurrection, we're, we're going to fill in the gap for two weeks, today and, uh, th today and next week, about what this looks like. But as we do that, let's think about who might be responsible for the death of Jesus. Some would say that Judas was responsible because he betrayed Jesus. It was foretold that he would be, that he would be betrayed by someone, and so Judas just fit the bill. And he was the one that, uh, that betrayed Jesus. So some would say, well, it's, Jesus, it, it's Judas' fault. Some would say it's Pontius Pilate that he was the one that actually gave the order. When you read through this passage, read through the different Gospels, you'll see that, uh, that, that Pontius Pilate gave the order. Uh, of course, he was, he was doing what the people asked him to do, crucify him, crucify him. And they said, listen, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what we'll do. The Roman soldiers, the ones that flogged, nailed, speared him. May, it was probably their fault, right? Some would say it was the, the, the Roman soldiers' fault. They were the reason why he died. Uh, the chief priests of the Jews and the Jewish nation, all the individuals that scream, crucify him, crucify him, the ones that plotted against uh, Jesus to actually arrest him and kill him. It must have been their fault. Or maybe, just maybe, I did it. And you did it. Maybe, just maybe, because I added to the sin of the world in my lifetime. I add to the sin of of the world, but ultimately, God did it. Make no mistake, nobody actually killed Jesus. He gave up his spirit. He is always in control. Do you hear that? When you're struggling with situations in your life and you have family, relational, friends, community dynamics going on, keep in mind, God is always Always, say that word, always in control of what's going on. He never gets a report in the morning and goes through his Google feed and says, oh, never. He already walked through and experienced all of it. He's, he's before all of it, during all of it, and beyond all of it. So you can rest assured in your faith that God is always in control. He's always in control. He's always working things according to his will. It may not be what you want, but it's exactly how he has designed it. This is exactly what he would have seen. It doesn't mean we're robots. We have choice through our life, but God is with you in all of these moments. He never, never left. We know that ultimately this is God. Uh, we can see from Isaiah 53, as we read a little bit last week, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush really himself and cause him grief. It was part of the plan, you see. It was part of the plan that he was going to die. Ultimately, God is in control of it all. So as we walk through Matthew 27, I'm not going to be overly graphic, but there are some things that you can't share without explaining a little bit. So bear with me as we walk through some of this together. You could actually study it yourself by going through some of these things, uh, so, you know, on your own, walking through Matthew 27, walking through the Gospels and seeing for yourself. We're going to start in verse 27. And we're going to uh, kind of pick this apart. We also have the verses on the screen if you'd like to follow along. Now, verse 27 of chapter 27 in Matthew, some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire uh, regiment. Now, this was a group of people that was probably about 600 men. 600 men were brought in at this time. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Now, that word robe, you'll want to underline that. They wove through branches, uh, th thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. The crown is significant, of course. You can underline that. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter, uh, underline scepter, or whatever translation you're using that indicates that staff, maybe. 
Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted him. Hail, king of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Romans did not invent crucifixion. They got it from the Persians. And the idea within the Persian religion or belief system is they believed in the, in the idea of the holy earth, if you will. And an individual that would die touching the earth would taint the earth. And so they put these individuals up on a piece of wood, a stake, a cross, to keep them off of the ground so when they died, they wouldn't actually affect the earth. That was their belief. And so the Romans then began to adopt the, the idea of crucifixion, uh, but they did not invent it. But there were two games that the soldiers would typically play with the criminal. Now, again, let's talk about this for just a minute. Uh, nobody was crucified. Nobody was crucified for a little small offense or just kind of a thing or back talk. This was the worst of the worst. They were considered criminals, revolutionaries. They were against everything. And so when we think about this man, Jesus, being put to, to death on this cross, we're, we're looking in it through the eyes of the soldiers that look at him and say, this guy has to go. He is bad news. He is uh, unpure. He is a criminal. He has done bad stuff. And so when they look at him, they're, they're mad. They're angry. They're just, they're taking out their frustrations and what they have to do and their frustrations on the criminal as well. They would typically play games with the criminal, two different games. The first game is the king's game, which we're familiar with. They would, this is not unique to just Jesus. When we read these stories, we often think, well, of course they did because that's what they did to Jesus. But this is consistent throughout crucifixions on what they would do to all the criminals. They would play the king's game with them and they would put on a robe and they would put on a crown and they would give them a scepter or a staff, and they would mock them. They would mock them, and they would pretend like they were bowing down to them to just humiliate them to the core of who they are. And secondly, they'd play a game called hot hand. This is where they blindfold the criminal, and they would stand, and the, the soldiers would surround the criminal, and they would, and they would punch this criminal in the face and they would say who hit you who hit you and if you could guess who hit you they would stop but if you guessed wrong then it would come from another angle and it's, inc it's excruciatingly difficult to actually call out who did it when you're kind of dazed and confused and spinning and maybe they're moving as well so the goal wasn't to have the criminal win the goal was to have the criminal beat and so this is consistent through, this is, they were treating Jesus like any ordinary criminal by playing games and by mocking him. Verse 32, along the way, they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Now, obviously, when we think about, like, how hard was this? This was a heavy piece of wood. This was an excruciatingly heavy piece of wood. And they would make those criminals that were being crucified carry their cross themselves as another act of humiliation, another act to say, uh, you know what, we control you. You're going to do what we say to do. And at some point in time, after a brutal attack, a brutal beating, he literally ran out of energy and fell to the ground. Now, to give you a little bit more of a picture on why would Jesus be so tired? Why would he be so lethargic? Why would he be so weak? 
Well, during the time when an individual is actually whipped, there's usually a long leather strap. And at the end of that strap, or a long cord, and at the end of that is uh, almost like fingers, leather straps, which will hurt, no doubt. But at the end of your fingers, are there not fingernails? And they would put little pieces of glass or bone at the end. And the goal of this wasn't to slap, it was to grab a hold and rip. So you can imagine after 39 lashes, this would get hard. And you're going, well, maybe it didn't always grab. Okay, well, consider how they typically would do certain beatings. They would, they would hold their hands up, they would tie them up, and even raise them up maybe above the ground just enough to make sure that their skin is very tight. And so when these whips would hit, it wouldn't just hit and maybe bounce off or hit a soft spot. It was tight, and it was easily scratched and torn. So Jesus, whose mother barely even recognized, he was unrecognizable, was now carrying a cross to a place that he prayed the night before. Is there any other way? And he just runs out of his human energy and hits the ground. And somebody is called upon to carry that cross. So he was tired. Not only was he up all night, which Jesus was probably used to staying up throughout the night praying and talking and things of that nature, but nonetheless, he, hadn't, he probably hadn't slept in a long time. Remember the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, they slept, they got a nap, but Jesus cried out and sweated blood in this desperation of this final trial in the Garden of Gethsemane, this by the olive press, as we learned last week. If you didn't see or hear last week, go back and re review that as a way of continuing on in our study, our Easter study. And so Jesus is absolutely worn out. His body is weak. His body is torn. His body is burning. Have you ever had a cut on your hand and you, you find out you have a vapor cut after you put hand sanitizer on your hand? And what do we do? Ooh, 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 ooh. And you can't even see it. Imagine your whole being being ravished like hamburger, and now I'm supposed to use my body to carry this thing, and, and they, maybe they put something over top of him, maybe there was cloth or something, now it's rubbing on his open wounds. He was tired, no doubt, and he's going through this because of the night before he said these words, any other way we can save humanity, any other way that we can do this, if you, would you please take this cup from me? But even if you don't do what I think is good, you do what you know is good, it's not my will, it's your will be done. And he's walking to a place. And then, then they went out to a place called Golgotha, which, or Golgotha, however you pronounce it, which means place of the skull. Now, the reason why it's called place of the skull is because the side of the hill actually looks like a skull. Like that's, that's a real thing. You can look up pictures and you can see that. But you know, in our pictures, we typically paint this beautiful scenery. It's a hill and we put the three crosses on a hill side. And we talk about how it was, we, we almost raise that up as though it's a unique event. He was not on the top he was next to it, next to the road. Because these individuals, where these criminals would be crucified along the side of the road so that when people would go by, they automatically know if you are up there, you are all bad news. And then people would take great delight in throwing out more mockery towards them. They didn't even know the person, but they assumed, uh, based on the fact that they're, sit they're on this cross, hanging on this cross, that something they must have done something wrong because why else would they crucify them? In verse 34, the soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, and, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. 
After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. Now, there's, there's a lot of imagery and things that we see. Uh, oftentimes, we see that Jesus was pierced here. Most likely, according to tradition, he was pierced here because there's something that it would actually hold on to based on your, the, the design of your wrist. So he was most likely pierced here, and he was pierced here. And then when it comes to the feet, we oftentimes would see that it would that there's this crossing. Jesus is standing there forward, and there's this crossing as though your feet are one on top of the other, and it goes this way, but rather they were more turned sideways, so it would go through about the heel of the foot. And so they were kind of more like this, all twisted up. And most of the time, the, these individuals, the criminals that were on the cross, they would die because of asphyxiation. They would not be able to breathe anymore. They would suffocate under their own weight. Why? Because the only thing holding you up is this nail that is going through here. And so you're holding on to your, with your wrists. And so they would have to kind of twist and push up to take a deep breath. And then they would go back down. And then they would just do that until they could not do it anymore. Oftentimes, the soldiers would go up to these individuals that were on the cross, and they would break their legs because they were sick and tired of waiting on them to die. And so if you don't have strength or even legs that are together, you can't push yourself up. Therefore, you just suffocate. This is a brutal thing. This is an absolute brutal thing. This is not the gentle Jesus that has a drop of blood coming from one side of his face. We try to depict things that are more attractive to our eye. I wouldn't dare want to gaze into what it really looked like. But it was not that. It was not a simple, a, a simple cut in the side with, with, a, with a little drop of blood. He was shedding everything he had completely out as he told the disciples he was going to. In verse 37, a sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And two revolutionaries, according to the New Living Translation, or criminals in other translations, were crucified with him. One on his right and one on his left. Now, the goal of crucifixion was to delay death as long as possible. Now, the soldiers got tired towards the end, and so that's why legs would be broken. But the goal was suffering. So when you hear when the Apostle Paul in any of the New Testament writing or even the Old Testament is prophesying this to the future, um, talk about his suffering, we're not talking like he already would have endured enough if it would have just gone through the betrayals, gone through the arrest, he didn't do anything wrong, and then going through the beating and going through the hitting and the mockery and all that. Even leading up to the cross right there would have been more than any of us would have ever experienced or even chosen to do for another person but that wasn't all that he did. Now he's going to the cross because that was the plan. That was what God had originally designed. And so the goal was for him to hang there for as long as possible to delay the pain. Now, we don't do that very well in our world today, especially in America. Right, we've got, you go to a kid's doctor, which is pretty cool. They have a spray. They'll spray on for about 10 seconds and it'll numb that area before they take blood so you can barely even feel anything. They'll immediately give you some sort of painkiller because they want to remove the pain, remove the displeasure to calm your body down. Their idea of this punishment was to increase and delay. Increase the pain and delay the death. This is what our Jesus 
experienced so that we could live. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Imagine walking by and you don't know them and we don't, and we can't judge these people for this because we do this too. We watch the news and we go, right? Just another person up there in Cleveland doing what they're not supposed to be doing. And we don't know the truth. We're hearing a form of the truth, but we just assume the truth. So these people are looking at the side, which is their news feed, and they're going, oh yeah, they had to have done something. And so they're shaking their heads as though they are above those who are dying. And one of them in this situation was Jesus. Why would these people be yelling at them? Well, because in their heads, the people on the cross deserve it. Oh, I see a man. Oh, the king of the Jews. He clearly deserves what he's getting. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said that you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then, if you are the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and the teachers of the religious law and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Do you understand what they're saying? They acknowledge these undisputed miracles. He saved others. They acknowledge that they, he did do something. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. But he can't save himself, so he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. You understand, since he did not come down to the cross, we believe in him. Had he come down, there would have been nothing that would have changed. So then Jesus is now a people pleaser. But th that was not the plan. This was the plan. You see, God treated Jesus the way that we deserved to be treated so that he could treat us the way that Jesus deserves to be treated. The only way we even have an audience with the Father is through the Son, and it's because of what he did here. Now, I know we don't always understand that doesn't make sense. Why does somebody have to die in order for me to live? But that was the way they, they understood that in the days of the Bible because they were always sacrificing animals and trying to atone or pay for their sins. And God said, we're going to do one more sacrifice, a spotless lamb of God, and we are going to cover all of that to take away the sins of the world and that's us we are that that's what he's doing here he did not come to remove the law but to fulfill the law to appease the law that because you there had to be a sacrifice a, a a blood sacrifice in order to be able to atone for sin and so he came to fulfill it once and for all that's why you and i don't have to do this anymore because jesus set up a new system. He trusted God. They mocked him. So let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries or the criminals who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. When Jesus was arrested and eventually died, he felt every type of pain imaginable. You think about this in your life if whether or not Jesus understands where you are. Jesus was physically in pain. Have you ever experienced physical pain? Jesus was in physical pain. He was beaten with fists, whips, nails, all kinds of things. He was physically hurting. Jesus felt the pain of being insulted. We would look at this as being bullied. We know what that's like to have somebody look at us and laugh and, and, and accuse and point fingers. We know what that's like when people are laughing at us. Jesus felt the pain of being betrayed, a time where somebody you thought was going to go to battle with you, somebody that was going to walk with you through your life, and they betrayed you. They told a secret they should have never told. They did something they should have never done. And you felt that pain to the core of who you are. 
Jesus felt that too. Jesus felt the pain of being misunderstood. You know as well as I do that if we were the one on the cross, if we even would have made it that far, that as they're yelling at us, as they're mocking us, as they're saying, well, that's what you deserve, you want to plead your case. No, I actually didn't do anything. Here, let me try to prove it to you. It doesn't matter. God had a plan, and God knows the truth. God does not have a misunderstanding. The world is not going to understand the things of the Spirit because they are not of the Spirit. So there's no sense in trying to completely explain everything of the Spirit to somebody who is not of the Spirit because we're told they may not understand it. Our job for the individuals that aren't there yet following Jesus is to explain this. This is what he did for you. What grace says is you get to choose to follow him or not. And then there's consequences either way. So Jesus felt the pain of being misunderstood. Jesus, who is God, understands pain very well. Of course, our sovereign God, our supreme power, supreme ruler, already knows all things. But because Jesus' death on the cross, we can now more fully understand how this man Jesus gets our pain. He didn't have to go to the cross to understand. Do you know that? He didn't have to go to the cross so that they're like, okay, great, now I'm going to fully understand everybody's pain. He already knew it. And that wasn't the point anyway. The point was to save us. But because he went through all that he went through, we can relate to it in our humanity. In the book of Philippians, the apostle Paul, one of the earliest leaders in the church, wrote a letter to some of the early Jesus followers in uh, Philippi. This passage is coming out of Philippians chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 13, or starting in verse 10. We're going to read together. Paul says, I want to know and Christ. So we're talking about this word know is I really want to experience Christ. I want to know him intimately. I want to know him relationally. I want to know him so well that I, I'm not confused when he walks by, that I'm aware of who he is and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So Paul goes on and he says, and I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. This doesn't mean that Paul actually wanted to go through the same things that he went through, but the word that's being used here for this idea of suffer is the capacity to feel strong emotion like suffering. It doesn't mean that it's always emotional, but it's this strong sense of what's happening and what has happened. But here's the idea. This word, pathema, which is uh, the Greek word for suffer, is not characteristically a negative thing. It is only negative experienced outside of faith. And so when we go through things for our faith, it's not characteristically a negative thing for us to go through a level of suffering. Not everything is hunky-dory. Not everything is calm and relaxed. You are going to, and you should expect to go through some difficulty if we're sharing our faith, if we're talking to people, if we're going through life with people, we should expect these things because they experienced it. Why would we think that everything should be fine with us? There are gonna be hardships. There are gonna be things we're gonna deal with. Oftentimes, the pain is for our good. Your pain has a purpose. Why would God allow? Why would God not allow? We don't learn until we feel the squeeze anyway. You don't stop spending money till you realize how broke you are. And then you feel the squeeze, God, please save me. Stop spending money. The money's still coming in. You just keep throwing it out the window. We don't learn until we feel the squeeze. The pain has a purpose. There's a reason why we're learning and growing through these things. And he goes on and he says, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. This is meaning the end goal. This, this means the end of his time that he's actually going to receive his prize, which is heaven. But I press on 
for uh, on to, to possess that perfection for which Christ first possessed me. So what he's saying here is just like a runner at the end of a race. If you watched any of the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, Summer Olympics, whatever, you know that whether or not they're skating or whether or not they're racing and they're running or anything, typically there's a way that they reach towards the end. Now here in this context, they're specifically talking about somebody that was running didn't have winter games. And so they had these games, though, where somebody is running, and as they're running, they would reach out for that, or maybe they would lean forward to be able to get a, just a head by a half a second to be able to get that win. And so what Paul is saying is that I press on. I'm near the end, and I'm pressing on, and I'm trying to go for it so that I can grab it. Not because he has to work for it, but because this is the attitude in the race that I'm longing for it, I'm going after it, I want to attain it. Again, he's already attained it. He's already attained it. So why would he have to reach for it? Because it's a heart posture thing. It's this reaching out, going for it. I'm pressing on through all the difficulties that I've experienced because I can't wait. Again, he says in verse 14, I press on, I pursue to, the, to reach the end of the race and receive. This idea of receive is to lay hold of or apprehend, to take hold of the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Jesus showed us that God understands our pain, but then Paul said he was trying to better understand Jesus's pain. This is not a happy passage of scripture. This is not a, a comforting moment where we sit and we go, yeah, let's sit around the dining room table and have a precious moment recanting the crucifixion. We are reminded of these things. And when we truly begin to know Jesus, actually check this out. It is comforting because he took what I deserved. And I can't fathom that. I can't fathom that he took what I deserved. Now, I'm not doing it. That's your problem. How many times have you said that? No, 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 no. That's their thing. I'm going to stay way over here so I don't have to deal with it. And he said, no, I'm going to take it on so that they can live. Jesus knows our pain. He knows our physical pain. He knows our emotional pain. He knows our spiritual pain. So in light of this, what is painful in my life right now? Here's a question I want you to ask yourself. What is painful in my life right now that I need Jesus to heal? Whatever you've got going on right now, God is with you. He is here. He is present. You might be experiencing a physical pain, an emotional pain, or a spiritual pain. And it may be your fault and it may not be your fault. But here's what we want to do as the church of Jesus. Jesus is, a way, is the way maker. There is but one way to the Father. He makes a way. And when, when we have these pains, we're, we're, at, we're, we're told to pray. And so I want to have a time with you today to be able to pray over you. Now, whether you're experiencing any form of pain, whether it's emotional pain, spiritual pain, physical pain, we want to pray over you. We have individuals within our room, even right now, that are just going to pray over you wherever you are. If you want to come forward and sit by the altar, if you come on this side, on this side of the altar, you want to pray by yourself, no one will approach you. You can have a place at a time by yourself, maybe with your family. Nobody approach anybody over here. If you want somebody to pray over you, if you would like me to just anoint you with oil and pray over you and just ask God, hey, we know, you're, we know if you're willing, you can do this. He gets to decide. We are not naming. We are not claiming healing. We are asking God for healing. And he gets to decide however he chooses to do it. We're simply talking to the Father. If you want to be prayed over with somebody, come to this side. And together we will all pray for each other.
worship you. I worship you. Yes, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Sing it out, way, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. You are here and you're turning lives around. I worship you. We worship you, Jesus, because you are here and you're mending every heart. I worship you. I worship. Stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even 
that you are faithful, you're faithful. I just keep praying over our church family this morning. Just one more time, Waymaker. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for your additional time this morning as the Spirit of God works in the lives of people. When you're aware of people that are in need or in hurt, look to Jesus. Don't focus on the pain. Don't focus on the difficulty. Focus on Jesus. And what did he tell us to do? Bear one another's burdens. He told us to pray for one another, anoint one another, empower one another, strengthen one another. And so we look to Jesus. This is what you're seeing right here within the church. Not just this local church, but any church that's the Spirit's working in. And press on together. So look to Jesus, press on together. Because when you look to the person you can see the addiction, you can see the pain, you can see the hardship, you can see the church hurt, you can see all kinds of that stuff right there. We don't wanna focus on all that. We're gonna look at Jesus and we're gonna press on together. And then we're gonna pray with each other. When somebody tells you they got something going on, you should stop right then and there, believer, and you need to find that courage in the name of Jesus. Say, well, let's pray about that. I have mentored people where they're now praying in supermarkets over people and people are going, what are you doing? I'm praying over you right now because that's what the church does. We are not uncomfortable to pray. We are not ashamed to lift other people up. We're gonna do this. We're gonna look to Jesus, press on together and pray with each other. You see, last week we learned that Jesus never gives up on us, amen? Praise God for that. He never, let's do this, yeah, come on. Jesus, under, he, never, he never gives up on us because he understands our pain. See how that works together? He understands our pain. He understands our pain. Romans tells us what Eve just wonderfully read to us moments ago. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. That means we no longer have to listen to sin. You can live a life where there's no sin. How do I know that? Because you're no longer slaves to sin. You can fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. For when he died, for when we died with Christ, that moment that we received Christ into our life, we are transported in that moment, right? We died with Christ. So we were set free from the power of sin. You choose from this point forward, believer, whether or not you sin. So here's our next steps. Let's take the fullness of today and let's bring it to uh, some sort of practical thoughts on how we can move forward. 
Are you hurting in any way right now, physically, emotionally, or spiritually? Some got to pray together. Some maybe were received healing. We don't know. We don't know what God's gonna do. He gets to decide that. But if it's true that Jesus understands what you're going through, what's one thing that you can do this week to respond to that truth? If we believe it, then how are you gonna respond? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you as your followers. Thank you for this wonderful day of celebration on you as we walk through these uh, vow renewals with the Rellers. Uh, that was about you. That wasn't about us. That was about what you can do in the lives of broken people. And so we give you the credit. We learned about your crucifixion today, maybe in ways that we hadn't thought about, uh, not to grow our knowledge base, but to focus on you. And then we had a privilege this uh, moments ago just to pray over people, pray over them for uh, physical, spiritual, emotional healing as you have given us the responsibility to do. And that's not about us. That's again, focused back on you. As we leave here today, as we acknowledge that you truly do understand our pain, that's because uh, we're gonna focus on that. We're gonna focus on you. We're gonna keep our eyes on you because the pain can be overwhelming. The triggers of that pain can be uh, pop up at any time. Even in the moments that we think we have it figured out, bam, there it is again. That's why we don't focus on the pain. We focus on you. You were and are and continue to be the promised lamb of God. Strengthen us today and every day until you come back or take us home. Can I just say thank you? Jesus, can I just say thank you? Thank you that we are never hopeless. We are truly never alone. For those who have put their faith and hope in you, it is secure. Revive our hearts to the first love of when we connected with you or thought of you or followed you for the first time. And again, not for us, but to focus on you, for your glory, and for your honor. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. All right, thank you for taking some extra time here this morning as we worship together, as we pray together, as we experience life together. Please stand, receive the blessing of the Lord as we head out here today. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Now say it with me. Go and be the church.